Hi everyone, we're just going to be working on a couple of small things this episode, mainly eliminating the seams between mesh chunks. But to start with, I'd like to quickly fix this bug that I introduced last episode, where if we move the viewer around, some mesh chunks are getting left behind. So if we go into the endless terrain script, we have this terrain chunks visible last update list, which is supposed to sort of tidy up behind us. So if you recall how this is working is that in the update visible chunks method, we're updating all of the terrain chunks within a sort of viewable range, and then each of those terrain chunks which is visible after the update, we add to the terrain chunks visible last update list so that it can be cleaned up next frame. Now the reason this is no longer working is that we're not only calling update terrain chunk from here, but also from the level of detail mesh class which we added in last episode. So we've got this little update callback to call the terrain chunks update method as soon as the mesh data is received so that we don't have any sort of delay. And uh, that of course means that the, that the terrain chunks visible last update list does not always contain all of the visible chunks. So, what we're going to do is we're going to remove that code from here and we're going to make the terrain chunks visible last update list static so that from the terrain chunk update method if the terrain chunk is visible then it's going to just add itself to that list so terrain chunks visible last update dot add and then to add ourself we just use the this keyword. All right, so now if we go back into Unity and just move the viewer around, you should see that that bug has been eliminated. Okay, so now let's look at this problem of aligning the map chunks so that we create the illusion of one continuous mesh. So if I just enable this mesh over here, we can have a closer look at how our offset is working. So First thing we'll see is that if I adjust this offset, the actual shape of the land masses is changing, which uh, is obviously something we have to fix. Another thing to notice is that if I increase the x-axis positively, the whole map is sort of shifting to the left, in other words, in a negative direction, which makes sense because obviously if we want to see what comes to the right of the map, then we have to shift the whole map left. But this is not working on the y-axis, if I increase y positively, then it moves up positively as well, uh, whereas in fact it should be moving downwards. So let's go into the noise script, and uh, we can invert the y offset simply by subtracting instead of adding it over here. Then to fix this problem of the land masses actually changing shape as we adjust the offsets, we're going to want these octave offsets to be affected by scale and frequency as well. So instead of just adding that on at the end of the line, let's put that inside of the brackets, and likewise for the y-axis. All right, so if I save and go back into Unity, we should see that this is working a little bit better now. If I adjust the x, it's sort of moving as a solid chunk, and y should now be moving downwards. So if I hide the mesh and go into play mode, we can see that uh, this is looking far more seamless, but it's not quite perfect. If we go down here, we can see that these are not lining up entirely. And the reason for this, if we go back into the noise script, is this section here where we're normalizing the map values between zero and one. So the problem is that min noise height and max noise height will have slightly different values for each of the different map chunks which is why they're not perfectly lining up. So this is still the preferred way of doing things if we're not using an endless terrain system, because if we can generate the entire map at once, then we'll know what the exact minimum and maximum noise height is, so then we can ensure that the full range of values is used. However, if we're generating the map sort of chunk by chunk, then we're going to have to essentially estimate what the minimum and maximum noise height values will be. So, to allow for both approaches to be used, let's add a public enum up at the top here, 
and we're going to call this the normalize mode. And this will have two modes, local for using the local minimum and maximum, and global for estimating a global minimum and maximum. All right, and then the generate noise map method will take in a normalize mode variable called normalize mode. And so down here, we can say if that normalize mode is equal to normalize mode dot local, then we will take this approach. Otherwise, we're going to have to do something else that is consistent across the entire map. So a good place to start would be to figure out what the maximum noise height value is that we could have. Now we're calculating noise height by adding Perlin value multiplied by amplitude for each of the octaves, and every octave amplitude is also getting multiplied by persistence. So the sort of maximum scenario is if Perlin value is equal to 1 every single octave. So up here, let's create a float max possible height and set that equal to 0 then when we're looping through these octaves, we're going to want to say max possible height plus equals amplitude. Now amplitude doesn't exist yet, so instead of declaring it over here, let's copy that and declare it up here instead. So we won't want to declare it again, of course, but we will want to reset, reset these values to 1. Um, and now just as we do over here, amplitude multiplied by persistence, we'll want to have in here as well. Okay, so at the end of this loop, we'll have found the maximum possible height value. So we can use that over here, let's say float normalized height is equal to, and we can get the value from the noise map. Now, remember up here, we were multiplying our Perlin value by 2 and then subtracting 1. So we're going to want to reverse that operation by adding 1 and then dividing this entire thing by 2. Then we're going to want to further divide it by the maximum possible noise height. So let's put this 2 in brackets and multiply it by the maximum possible noise height. Okay, I think just to emphasize that these are the local values, I'm going to quickly rename this to min local noise height and this to max local noise height. Okay, so we've got our normalized height here, and then let's just set noise map xy equal to that newly normalized height. Okay, let's give this a try. We're going to have to... Uh, add the normalize mode to this call here. So up at the top of the map generator, let's just add in a public noise dot normalize mode variable. And then when we make this call to generate noise map, we can just add that in. Normalize mode. All right, save and go back into Unity. And I'm just going to re-enable my mesh here so that we can preview it with this. So when this is set to local, this is just the same old method, which works nicely for a single chunk. Um, but when we set this to global, you can see that our range of values has been greatly diminished. And the reason for this is that we've calculated what the maximum possible height is, but our noise map values are in fact never going to come anywhere close to that value. So this is where we have to basically estimate a little bit. So we could try, for example, dividing this by 1.5. So let's save that and hit generate. And we can see this is a little bit better. Um, we're not quite getting the peaks, so we can divide this by something a little bit higher, say 1.75 maybe. And we can just keep doing this and try to sort of find round about what the maximum value is going to be. And this is working quite well. Um, you can see here we've got some parts. This, this little black part is uh, 
an area that has exceeded the maximum. It's, it's got a value of greater than 1. And if I just, for example, set this to something like 2.5, then we're going to see many more areas which exceed a value of 1. Uh, so if I generate this now, we're getting a lot of this sort of plateau effect. So we're going to have to accept that in some areas of our map, the height range is going to exceed 1. So we should account for that by being a little bit less strict with our mesh height curve and just making this exceed 1 a little bit so that uh, we don't get that harsh cutoff, which can be a little bit ugly. All right, so something like that is a bit better. Um, let's change this back to 1.75 though, since that seemed to be working quite nicely overall. Um, and then we're going to want to fix this problem of the values that are exceeding 1 being assigned the wrong color. So let's go into our map generator and have a look at this section where we're actually assigning the colors to the regions. So due to the changes we've been making, we can of course no longer assume that current height is in the range 0 to 1. It would be nice though if we could at least assume that it was not less than 0, however. So in our noise class, let's just quickly clamp this. Let's say mathf.clamp and clamp the normalized height between 0 and then for an upper bound we can just say int dot max. Okay, so now in the map generator we're instead of saying if current height is less than or equal to the region's height then assign the color, we're going to say if it's greater than or equal to the region's height then assign the color and we'll only break once we've reached a value which is less than the region's height. Okay, so uh, with this change, we're now saying that our regions should start at zero. Okay, and this seems to be working all right. Let's try it out with the endless terrain system. So I'll just hide the mesh and enter play mode. So we can see that um, the transition between two mesh chunks is now pretty much seamless. We do have this slight color change which is because of a discrepancy in the normals and that's something that we'll fix later on but it's not quite as visibly jarring as actually having the vertices not align. Um, also, of course, between different levels of detail, uh, we're not able to get these to align perfectly, but of course the viewer will be too far away to see that, and by the time they approach, the level of detail will increase and those will match up. So, that's looking pretty good. Uh, my only concern is that the sort of snowy peaks are very few and far between. So what we could do is just change this estimated value here. I'm going to bump it up to 2, and uh, if I change it to 2, then of course I can actually just cancel these both out. Um, just save that, and let's give it another try. So got my snowy peaks back, and it's looking pretty nice. We'll probably want to come back onto our mesh here and just adjust some of these regions a little bit. So maybe can bring the shallow water down a bit, extend the sand a little bit further, maybe the same for the grass. Probably want to do this for all of these. And just the snow as well. All right. Um, the, the last thing I'd like to do in this episode is just to provide a way to uh, scale our generated terrain uniformly. So, for example, uh, if we wanted it to match the scale of our player, we could just scale it out, something like this. Uh, of course, doing it this way, scaling the map generator object isn't going to work, because then if we now move our viewer around, it's just going to break everything. So let's head over to the endless terrain script 
And at the top here, I'm going to add in a constant float scale, just set that equal to one by default. And then in the terrain trunk class, when we are setting the position equal to position V3, we can multiply that by scale. And then we also want to set the mesh objects uh, scale. So mesh object dot transform dot local scale is equal to vector three dot one multiplied by scale. And then instead of manually updating all of the things like the uh, viewer move threshold, as well as all of the detail level distance thresholds, we can quite simply scale the viewer position since everything is based on that. So we'll take this vector two and just divide it by scale. So now if we go into play mode, everything will hopefully still be working. And it does seem to be. And then if I go in here and change the scale up to five, for example, we should see that everything is working, but just at a much larger scale. All right, so that's everything for this episode. And uh, until next time, cheers.